This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I'm joined by my co-host, Joshua Ryan Rusin, the community director of Jake and Gino. Josh, how are you doing today, Josh? Gino, making it happen, man. I'm excited to ramp up for the holiday season and uh, just the continued grind. What's going on in your world? I am excited to interview this student today because of a couple of things we spoke about before camera. Really intelligent dude, works hard, shows up, comes to the events, comes to Toastmasters. He's my Toastmasters buddy there. He comes to the group coaching calls. He puts in the work. He puts in the effort. This is what we need in life. Education is great. But education times action equals your results. We're not just an education company. We're an implementation company. And it's becoming more and more apparent to me today that people that succeed have to get educated, but they need to take action and need to be held accountable. And every time I see him at all these events, I saw him at MM4. I saw him right this past weekend. And he's coming from a place that's not easy to get to. Everyone's always complaining, oh, it takes time. Well, he's got to take two flights to get where he's going half a day. And that doesn't stop him from doing it. So if you're out there and you're hungry and you want to make it happen, open your ears, take out a pen and paper, because we're going to be taking some notes and taking a deep dive, Josh. Boom. All right. So today's guest, Mr. Senate Eskridge. Senate is an avid real estate investor who currently owns a managed portfolio of single family and multifamily homes, numbering over 300 units across the country. Right. He has five years of experience in real estate investing and more than 20 years of experience in business development, management, and sales. Without further ado, welcome to the show, Senate. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to this. I am so excited to sit down and talk with the two of you. Thanks for having me. So, Senna, I, I got to put one note here, man. As I'm sitting there looking in the background, I see you got the honeybee, passive investing made simple, a Weirbill Profits water bottle. You know, I thought Gino had a good setup with all the <laughs> swag and stuff, man. I, you guys are making me look plain and vanilla. I got to step it up. You know, I believe that the more you put into your mind and what you focus on is what happens, right? Mm -hmm. You get what you focus on, what you think about is what your results. So I put these things out there so that I'm constantly thinking about making it happen and focusing on multifamily and looking for results. That's why that stuff's in my vision all the time. Also, while I never take this thing off, well, I take it off in the shower. But other than that, I it's there every single day to remind me to focus on multifamily, focus on my dreams so that I can make sure that I'm going to make it happen. Senate, how did you get into real estate? What were you, what was your, your previous job and how did you get into, into the real estate space? Those are two great questions that I'm going to answer them separately. Mm -hmm. I got into real estate by accident, truthfully. I lived in a, in a remote town and I worked 30 miles or so from where I lived. And I had three cars every single day that would drive 30 miles into town and 30 miles back to town. I drive in for work. My wife would drive in for work. And then my oldest daughter would drive my kids to school. That's three round trips a day. And then usually we'd get one more trip to go back to the store to see grandma or something like that, constantly driving. I sat down and did the math. And by moving closer to, to town, we would save almost a thousand dollars a month at the time. It was massive amount of savings. Mm -hmm. Had to move. I went out and found another house to buy. Well, this was 2008. Nobody's buying houses in 2008. <laughs> what do you do? I decided to rent that house out. Couldn't sell it. I had a person to move in there. A while later, I realized I was making some pretty good cash flow on this house. I was very excited about it. What do you do with that? You go do it again. Bought another house. Got some good cash flow from that. And then uh, the third house was a junker. I bought it. Had to fix it up. I was doing the Burr strategy that everybody's talked about. Well, somebody offered me a bunch of money for it before I could uh, refinance it. Lo and behold, I flipped a house and uh, fell in love with the flipping. You make 30, 40 grand, whatever it was at the time in, in a short stint. I went and did that again. Then I bought a duplex, triplex, fourplex. At one point, I got up to the point where I had 14 properties that I was renting out. And that's when I sat down and I did the math. Getting up to 14... I have this specific cash flow goal in mind. It's going to take me a very long time to get to that cash flow. I got to do something different. At that point, I started looking at every other aspect of real estate you could imagine. Everything from self-storage to industrial, retail, going and doing the birth strategy in other markets. It's funny. I actually really looked at Macon, Georgia really hard. And I love hearing Bill Ham talk about Macon, Georgia, because I, I spent a lot of time looking in that market. 
Yeah, but back when you were I, looking at it, they weren't four caps. Now they're four <laughs> caps. There were probably nine and ten caps when you were looking at it, correct? Yeah, exactly. I mm-hmm. thought it was a great market. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Finally, I settled on multifamily because it just made the most sense to me because I'd already had experience renting out houses, had property managers, had people that could do residential uh, construction type, those types of things. Mm-hmm. And what did you do for your W-2 job or your, your job right as you were getting into the real estate? You know, I've been in financial advising for the majority of my career. Mm-hmm. I've helped people do investments. I've helped people work with money, uh, retirement accounts, life insurance, um, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, those types of things. Mm-hmm. Essentially sales of some sort my entire life. Mm-hmm. And have you transitioned full-time into real estate and left that career? What, what I like to say is, is that I invest in apartments and I help other people invest in apartments full-time. And on the side, I actually still currently sell IT services for an IT services firm. Awesome, dude. I love that. It's about so, mindset. So what was the problem that you were experiencing before joining Jake and Gino with multifamily? Was it just like pie in the sky thinking I can't get multifamily? How am I going to do that by myself? Lack of education really is what it came down to for me. Mm -hmm. I actually put in some offers on some multifamily buildings and I didn't get them. Thank goodness I didn't get them because I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I actually went out and I put an offer on a 20 unit property Mm -hmm. with a residential real estate agent. I said, hey, go look at that property. I want want to put an offer in on it. Get me the information on it. They sent me some information, uh, a couple of, at the time I didn't know what it was. They sent me a rent roll and a PL statement. And I was calculating it based on the 1% rule, which mm-hmm. is for single families. And it works great in that, in that market or that industry. But I went in, I put an offer and I was obviously not in the, in the ballpark. I didn't even respond. And I would felt a little bit deflated. How do I compete in this game? How do I get into 20 units? And uh, I decided at that point that I needed some education. And what other frustrations did you feel? Did you understand analyzing a market? Did you understand the metrics of you know, cap rates? Did you understand negotiating with brokers? Did you understand partnerships? All of these things that are pretty overwhelming when you first start out. Can you dive into some of the uh, some of those other frustrations? Truthfully, Gino, I didn't know what I didn't know. I, I wasn't frustrated by a lot of those things because I didn't even I didn't even realize that I could go to another market to do this mm. or to have a partner uh, to do those types of things. I didn't even I thought I had to do it all myself. Mm-hmm. And to do it all myself, I have to be right here in this market. And I have a very limited supply of inventory. And it just didn't, I didn't have the proper vision. You know, there's, there's this analogy uh, about light, right? And when you, when you light a candle, you can see a little bit more. And maybe you can see that next candle. Mm-hmm. And so what education to me was, was lighting more candles in the room. And I could now see a little bit more of the room. Mm-hmm. And actually, once I got that education, I was a little more frustrated afterwards because I realized what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And I realized that I was making these mistakes. I love that, everybody. Stephen Covey says it best. I always love his quote. People see the world as they are, not as it is. And I had a very similar experience with Senate when I first started out. I'm in the market of New York, 45 minutes north, nothing cash flows, expenses are hard. And until I got educated, went out and invested in a mentorship program. Oh, I can invest outside my market. Oh, I can get third-party property management. I didn't have any of those thoughts. And that's the amazing thing. When you start being who's successful, as Josh likes to say, success leaves clues. If you want to get into a certain endeavor, find out who's really making the difference in that endeavor and actually go out there and get educated on it. And then obviously taking that massive action. What was, a, what was the big difference once you joined the community? What did you learn from the community and from the education itself that you were able to utilize to get, start getting into deals? I would say the biggest epiphany that I had of getting when once I got into the community was that I didn't have to do it all myself and that I could focus in on one aspect of the business. Mm. That totally changed the game for me to be able to allow partners to come in and add value to me and allow me to add value to them. I love that. What, what else has the, uh, the community allowed for you? What else have you, if you, you know, as far as value gotten from the, from the Jake and Gino community? The community that you and the rest of the team have built has been transformational to me on so many levels. I've learned about multifamily, cap rates, markets, ask the difference between asset management and property management. I've learned about the ability to go out and raise capital. I've learned about the, just the different aspects of the business and the fact that multifamily is a business, not an investment. I, when I first got in multifamily, I still thought of it as how I invested in houses. 
I wasn't a business owner. I didn't have a business mindset in that aspect. I love what you say about creating multifamily entrepreneurs, real estate entrepreneurs. That's really the biggest thing there in that aspect. But on top of that, it's the ancillary things that people really don't think about. We talked right before we started recording about, I've met some people in this community that will be my lifelong best friends. I could show up in any one of five or 10 cities and have a place to stay. I didn't have that before. I was very sheltered, uh, a very well connected in my community, very well connected here locally where I'm at. But outside of this community, I really didn't have a lot of connections. The networking, the people that I, that I built those relationships with, absolutely phenomenal. Sub under that, which is a piece of it, all the other little things that, uh, that we get to do, things like Toastmasters, uh, things like the couples coaching with my wife, the fact that my family's included in the journey. There's just so many, so many things. And let me highlight this to everybody. Senate is well-spoken. You may be saying, hey, you know, he's just lucky on the podcast and just getting out there. He's been on Toastmasters for the last few months, every Wednesday night with the Jake and Gino crew working on that skill. We're not born with any skills. We need to learn the skills if we want to, you know, being on the couples coaching, coming out to the events, MM4 in October, coming out to the finance right this past weekend, going to the event before that. I mean, that's what it takes. It takes an amazing community, but it takes you as the listener to go out there and put that effort to be able to grow and to be able to find the right fit. You know, the, the community that you're joining has to have the right fit, has to resonate with you. And like you say, we create multifamily entrepreneurs. If you're out there trying to get rich in the next 12 to 18 months, this is not the community for you because we want to build legacy wealth, but legacy skills. And like Senate said, it's so important to for us to involve your family in that journey. So for them to actually, you know what, you're going to have something to pass on to them. It's not just money. It's not just buildings. It's actually a skill set and a mindset that you can pass on to them. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Let's talk about the deal. I mean, you've closed deal. Let's talk about what deal, one deal you want to discuss with the, uh, with the listeners out there. My first multifamily deal is one that I put together for you. It was a great mm -hmm. asset right here in my hometown, 18 units, mm -hmm. one bed, one bath, uh, way under market rent. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that. And truthfully, when I first looked at the deal, I was a little scared. What's it, what's it going to look like? Mm -hmm. How's it going to work? And uh, we put it together and, and it's been a phenomenal deal. I tell you, I, I thought it was going to perform here and it's actually performing here. Mm. And this is a testament to the uh, power of partnerships. I actually worked with this on a team with a team of people that, that I met and that are actually all part of the Jake and Gino community. <clears throat> My partner uh, reached out to the owners of this property almost a year ago before we got it and said, I'm interested in your property. Do you want to sell? And the answer was maybe someday. And so he continually followed up with this owner and built a relationship with them and called him. I don't know the number of times, three or four, maybe five times over the course of a year. And finally, the guy said, you know, maybe I'd sell it someday. Why don't you sit down and give me, give me an offer? Let's, let's talk about it. That's really how we got into it. Mm -hmm. They brought the deal to me and, and we worked through all the underwriting and all the numbers and figured out what we had to do to be able to, to make an offer on it. And with the way the markets, the, the rents were so far under market, there was no way we were going to be able to get a, get a bank to finance it. Mm -hmm. The, the debt service coverage ratio, something I've learned through the Jacob Gino community was actually really low. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Well, you've got it. You've got to be creative, right? Mm -hmm. Bill Ham's book about creative cash. We went back to him and asked him to do an owner financing on it. This, the only way this works is because my partners had built that relationship with this gentleman and built the level of trust with him. We went out and we put out a creative offer, offered him a good size down payment and asked him to carry the note back. And he agreed to it. We have a, a five-year note with this person with a two-year prepayment uh, program on it and a five-year balloon. What that means mm -hmm. is we've got to, we've got to refinance it somewhere between years two and five mm -hmm. and, and pay them off. It was a great asset. It's a little bit older, uh, but in our market, that's okay. We are very educated about that market and what the needs are of that building. We've got a pretty dry climate, so buildings don't deteriorate the same way as they do in other, other areas. And so just knowing that asset, knowing the age and the quality, we decided to go in and start with that outside in renovation. Mm -hmm. And we got this great business plan of we're going to, we're going to do all new paint on the outside. We're going to clean up the outside, just make it beautiful so that the people really want to live there. 
Mm-hmm. Well, we got into it. <laughs> and I don't know if you know, but there's this big pandemic thing that's been happening and, and nobody can get any supplies. So when I said I need, I don't remember the number, 50 gallons of paint or something like that to paint this building, the paint supply store said, uh, okay, but it's going to be some astronomical number. I think the quote was $30,000 and I budgeted 15, literally double the cost. Well, we're not doing that. We decided to put that on hold. We're going to do that in the spring. Mm -hmm. And so we shifted gears and now we're doing inside renovations right now, Mm -hmm. focusing on floors, countertops, paint, kitchens, bathrooms to make this a place that somebody would want to live. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to uh, take the rents from sub low 400s and we're almost 800 on those renovated units. Wow. And we added in rubs. Right. Wow. So we're building back for utilities. We've projected that we're going to be able to double the value of this business in two ish years. When I go back to the bank and ask them to refinance it, it's going to be a slam dunk. Yes. So, so everybody, he's got creative financing with seller financing. He's got refi and roll in there. He's got the market selection in there. He's got the business plan in there. So Sen, you've really, really when you look at the deal and constructed the deal, it's an amazing deal. In 18 units, when you refire that deal out, you're going to have all your money back on that deal, a stable asset. It's going to be cost segregated. Uh, and then on top of that, it's going to be going going forward. You have that money, you're going to repurpose it into another asset. Congratulations on that. Anything else you want to add about the deal? You know, the, you mentioned cost segregation. Mm-hmm. One more piece that we didn't even realize when we bought it, this thing's in an opportunity zone. And because we're going to put all this money into it, we're going to increase the value of it and we're going to hold it for 10 years. There's a giant capital gains benefit on that, that we didn't even realize when we were going into it. It was kind of an accident. This one was a slam dunk, but more important than any of those types of things, it was a great education for myself and my partners. I want to highlight, I've learned a ton. I made a few mistakes, but most importantly, I've got a great team of people behind me that are helping me make, make this work. That is awesome. Last question before we go to the short answers. What does life look like now that you've closed the deal and that you're continuing on uh, the multifamily uh, journey? Really, I opened my mind and opened my vision that I can buy any size asset that I can focus on. And, and that change, that shift in my mindset has been pretty important. I, I now can look at a good size asset you know, up to $10 million, 15 million, whatever that is, and not get scared when I, when I look at it, because I know that I have those resources. I have a pretty specific timeline and pretty specific goals of what I want to accomplish. And I know absolutely that I'm going to get there. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors. Gino, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know that you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who want to follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. All right, Senate, I got some short answer questions for you. So you're a guy who has a dialed in mindset and rock solid habits. What would you say your best habit for success is? You know, probably the biggest, I don't know if this is really a habit, but what I like to do is, is I like to focus on maximizing every moment of every day. I don't, I don't waste time. I'm very intentional about my time. I would say, so the answer, the short answer is intentionality. I'm very intentional about every single thing that I do. I fill every minute. And when I am filling every minute, I'm 100% dialed in and 100% focused on that. I'm spending time with my wife. I'm spending time with my wife. If I'm doing a deal, I'm doing a deal. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. All right. Now, obviously, you're someone who's a big reader. You have a huge bookcase behind you. What's your favorite book and why? Oh, man. I don't know if I can answer that question, Josh. There's so many great books that I've read. You know, uh, T.R. Becker's got a great book. Uh, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, and there's How to Win Friends and Influence People that have just all been foundational for me. But I thought a lot about it because I, I kind of thought you were going to ask me that. So I narrowed it down to two. The first one is Outwitting the Devil 
by Napoleon Hill. Mm. It's kind of an obscure book that not a lot of people uh, know about. Obviously, they think about his other famous book out there, but this one really is about the secrets of the mind. And it, it was not published until actually very recently. It's an interesting story. He wrote this book and really what it is, it's about a conversation with himself and the devil, which really is about your subconscious and your limiting beliefs. But his, his wife asked him, don't publish that book. People will think that we're Satan worshipers or something like that. So he locked it away in a safe based on his wife's uh, request. And after he passed away and after his wife passed away, one of his kids found the book and said, we have to publish this. It's life-changing and it truly is life-changing. So my first book I would suggest to anybody is Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. But again, right. I have to I have to give a second one. I can't help it. Uh, there's a great book called 177 Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class. And it was written by a guy named Stephen Seabold. Steve Seabold. This one is a lot more tactical. It's 177 chapters. Every chapter is a page or two. And it's all about a specific thing that world-class achievers do. You want to talk about the best habit for success? Open to some random chapter and read it. It'd be a phenomenal habit for you to adopt. Man, I love that. All right, Senate question. When you listened to or read Outwitting the Devil, did you listen to it? Because in the Audible, they actually, it's a creepy voice for the devil. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I did both, actually. I listened to it first, and then I went back through it, and I highlighted a whole bunch of takeaways through the book. But yeah, I did read it, and it is pretty creepy. It's amazing. Josh and Senate, I had the privilege of podcasting Sharon Lecter, go to the Jake and Gino channel, and we had her on. She's the one who co-authored that, and she rewrote the book out, and she launched it. So it's uh, she's written 14 books, most of the Rich Dad series, and you know she's the one who's written the books, and she wrote that one as well, and, and she said that was one of her favorite books to read. And I read it also, and it's pretty scary looking at it with the times we're in now and reading that book and going, wow, we see what's going on right now, and there's just this big divide, and, and you got your inner voice we call it gremlins and life coaching and if you can work towards that that's what the gremlin that's what the the devil is trying to do he's trying to play on your emotions of resistance like with the war of art from stephen pressfield always holding you back and always putting poison in your minds and always putting that self-doubt that's a great recommendation I, I i love the book as well thank you love that all right so guys listen gino there's been a ton of takeaways in this episode let's uh let's hear the recap so Senate Eskridge in 2008 is spending $1,000 a month commute. He's saying, this is crazy. This is a ton of money. I, I got to move, move closer to my home, to my job. So he decides to go buy a house. But the problem is he's got one already. And he's like, what am I going to do with this one? Accidentally, he starts renting it out. So that's making a few bucks on it. He says, this seems like a pretty good gig. Let me buy another one. And then let me buy another one. And that's how the investment business starts. And along that journey, he figures out, this is a lot of work. If I got to keep scaling up, I have this cash flow number. How am I going to get to it if I continue this rinse and repeat, this Burr model of doing these small, these small apartments or these single family homes? And he stumbles across the Jake and Gino community and he starts educating himself. He starts reading about multifamily, reading all the different books, joins a community. And what I love most about it is that he just doesn't join. He's not passive. If you're passive in life, you're going to get passive results. He was active in life and he's continues to be active till this day. Like I said, coming to the events, watching the trainings, partnering up with, with other individuals, going to different markets, expanding his mindset. And now all of a sudden a $10 million deal, he's not afraid of it. He's able to conquer it. But why is that? Because there's no more fear left because he's conquered his fear. Because once you understand something and it can make sense, it's all of a sudden not afraid, not you're not afraid of it anymore. So take his blueprint, see what he's done, start with the education, then with the action, and then continuing along with your action and continue along with, I'm sure that Senate revises his goals. He's got goals written out and he's intentional because somebody says intentionality is one of their habits. They are intentional with laying out weekly goals, monthly goals, yearly goals, five-year goals, whatever that looks like. So be intentional in your life as well. Boom. I love that. All right. Set it. How can the listeners get a hold of you? you know, I, I'm pretty active on, on social media, but the Facebook, LinkedIn, but the best way to get a hold of me is just go to my website. Pretty easy. www.senateskridge.com or just shoot me an email. Senate at senateskridge.com. All right. Well, listen, Senate, I want to thank you for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing your movers and shakers story. Now, guys, listen, if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a mover and shake of week. See you, everybody. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks.